Two of the greatest fighters of all time stepped back into competition this past weekend with very different results. One man added to his legacy, while the other one just left us all feeling a little bit sad. Welcome to the RDX Sports Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the RDX Sports Podcast. I'm Simon Head, and what a weekend of combat sports we had this past weekend. Friday night in Arlington, Texas, Dallas Cowboys Stadium played home to a huge event. Whether you call it a sporting event in terms of the main event, I'll leave that up to you to decide. But Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson was a huge, huge cultural event. It was transmitted to 65 million households across the world and Netflix's servers completely melted down, as did a lot of the people who were suffering with the buffering. But the fight itself, was it a sporting event? Was it really any kind of advert for the sport of boxing? No, not really. Jake Paul defeating Mike Tyson, 58-year-old Mike Tyson, uh, on points after eight largely one-sided rounds. Mike Tyson just couldn't move. He was too slow. He was too old. His feet, unfortunately, just weren't under him for that fight. He didn't have that trademark footwork and pivoting and being able to being able to stay in the pocket while avoiding damage. But then he didn't have that 20 years ago either. He was in remarkable shape for a 58-year-old man. Absolutely incredible shape he got himself into. We've all seen the training videos leading up to the fight. Him absolutely cracking those pads with coach Rafael Cordero. But when it comes to actually getting in there and fighting another man, unfortunately, uh, Mike was just not in any shape to compete. I think he even had his knee in a knee brace. So um, really, as a, as, a pro- as a professional boxing match, which is what it was sanctioned as, it really should never have been happening. Jake Paul, meanwhile, I think he got what he wanted out of it. He got the huge payday. He got the huge audience. He got the huge attention. And now he's got the huge name on his record. Ridiculous as it is that he had to fight Mike Tyson at age 58 uh, to put him on that record. It is what it is. But it's going to be interesting to see just what happens with Jake Paul's boxing career after this because he's basically taken the ultimate fight in terms of facing an aging name. There are no bigger names in boxing than Mike Tyson. And uh, he's been in there with him, albeit at that advanced age. So what's he going to do next? We will discuss that in just a second. But let's talk about the event for a minute. I think there's about 65, 65, 69,000 people in AT&T and Stadium, AT&T Stadium, excuse me, in Arlington, Texas. Huge crowd. I believe it's one of the biggest gates in uh, in boxing history in terms of just the average ticket price. I think it's about three hundred dollars average ticket price, which is which is pretty high. Um, but sixty five million households globally. As I mentioned, the network, uh, the Netflix network, their whole servers just could not handle the load. Lots of buffering issues. We used to see him Michael Buffer at boxing. We used to see him Bruce Buffer at MMA. But at Mike Tyson versus Jake Paul, we just had that swirly sign of death with the uh, the internet buffering was, uh, was present for that fight. Big disappointment. And uh, Netflix have got some work to do because they've got some even bigger events coming down the line. On Christmas Day, they're, they're hosting two, streaming two NFL games on Christmas Day internationally. Massive, massive load is going to uh, be placed on those servers. And Netflix are going to have to fix that within a space of a little over a month to uh, to make sure that that's going to work okay. And then in January 2020, 2025, WWE is coming to Netflix. Monday Night Raw will be there stateside. And I believe the entire package of WWE content will be available internationally on Netflix. That means certainly once a week on a Monday, but twice a week, they're going to get a huge traffic spike every week. And those servers are going to need to be in place and working to make sure that they don't have another meltdown scenario. But while Netflix have got problems to fix, Jake Paul needs to decide what he wants to do with his career next because he fought Mike Tyson and Tyson looks old. And Jake Paul did not look good. Um, He couldn't do anything with Mike Tyson early on. He was trying to look flashy and land some big shots. But I think when he decided that he couldn't get him out of there, he just took his foot off the gas and decided to just sort of stick a move and stay out of trouble himself, avoid the embarrassment of getting clipped 
late on in the fight just by one haymaker from Tyson, took it to the scorecards and won. But what on earth does he do next? If you're Jake Paul, what direction do you take? Do you go down the influencer route? KSI is still there. The KSI fight is a huge fight for Jake Paul that could be made at the drop of a hat. Just bing, just make the fight. It would be a huge fight for that, that particular space. It's a fight that's been bubbling away under the surface for years. I think the time has come now. If this fight is ever going to be made, it probably needs to be made in 2025. If it isn't that, then what do we do now? Tommy Fury has been booked to face Darren Till at Misfits Boxing in, I think, the second week of January 2025. And that already has kicked off this week. Darren Till absolutely getting in the head of uh, Big John Fury, all hell breaking loose at the press conference announcing the fight this week. But the winner of that would also probably make for a half decent fight for Jake Paul as well. If it's Tommy Fury, it's a rematch against the one guy who's beaten him. If it's Darren Till, it's another MMA guy, but a guy who's much closer to his prime and someone who is actually a natural striker might make for a more entertaining fight, would certainly make for a more entertaining build-up. Darren Till has absolutely no Fs to give. He will go up there and say whatever he wants, and um, he's already doing that with the Tommy Fury fight. A fight with him and Jake Paul would certainly generate some uh, some interesting viral moments in the lead-up. The big daddy, though, is the Canelo fight. That's the fight that Jake Paul really wants. I just cannot see him getting that fight. You've got to be vaguely credible, surely, for Canelo to even give you the time of day. Canelo's running out of opponents to face. There's probably only two names I can think of, think of off the top of my head that would make for really interesting, viable opponents for Canelo. And he's not going to face one of them. David Benavides, for me, is the biggest fight that Canelo Alvarez could possibly, ma uh, could possibly make. He doesn't seem to want that fight. He seems to be actively avoiding that fight, moving away from that fight. And the only other fight that would be certainly of interest on our side of the pond is a fight with Chris Eubank Jr. That would be a big step up in class for Chris Eubank Jr. Um, he's probably going to be facing uh, Conor Ben at some point early next year. I would imagine they'll do that fight first. And potentially a fight with Canelo might be further down the line. Who knows? But really, the options are starting to run thin for Canelo Alvarez. So maybe he needs to move up a division or he needs to turn his sights to somewhere else. Could it be that Canelo Alvarez actually says, do you know what? This is not a difficult payday for me. I could get an absolutely massive payday, get in there and just stop all of this Jake Paul uh, boxing business with one swing of one of my heavy hands. That would be it all done. And I get paid handsomely for it. Maybe you could be convinced to do it. Who knows? But for me, the number one fight that, and I don't know how on earth you make this fight. I really don't. But if it could be made, it would be absolutely, you know, you'd be printing money. It would be Jake Paul versus Conor McGregor. Is there a bigger non-traditional fight out there that you could think of? Conor McGregor, biggest star to come out of the UFC, hasn't fought in ages, dealing with some significant uh, issues away from the cage in terms of uh, civil cases and, and various other things going on. But when he's when he's actually in fight camp, he's in shape and he's booked to fight. He is absolute box office TV. He's must-see TV every time he's booked to fight. His fights are a huge occasion and they are legit fights. Jake Paul, I think, wants to be very much like Conor McGregor in terms of the amount of money he's earning, in terms of the amount of influence that he's grown. But Jake Paul has not yet got that mainstream respect. And I think that to go in there and, and beat Conor McGregor, I think would help him get a bit more of that rub. And I think that would certainly appeal to him. Whether that fight ever happens, though, there are so many barriers. The UFC probably would not want that fight to happen. And they have Conor McGregor tied up in a contract for now. What happens when it comes to the end of that contract? Who knows? But um, it would be very interesting if we could ever see that fight get booked. Jake Paul versus Conor McGregor would be massive. But if I was a betting man, and I kind of am, I think the common sense fight next would probably be the winner of that Tommy Fury versus Darren Till fight. See how that plays out in uh, in early 2025 and be ready with, a, with an offer to take on the winner in the summer of next year. But uh, yeah, Jake Paul beating Mike Tyson does nothing really from a sporting context did big numbers proved that he could put on a big event 
and the staging in the event was outstanding. But from a boxing perspective, from a sports perspective, it was just a sideshow. It was just a circus. Personally, I just want to see I just want to see Jake Paul in a competitive fight. We haven't seen many of those. Put him in a competitive fight. Let's see how good he can be. Uh, but we shall see what happens in 2025. Also on that fight card down there in Arlington, Texas, uh, was the co-main event, Casey Taylor versus Amanda Serrano 2. And in pure sporting terms and in any kind of entertainment terms, this was the fight of the night. This should have been the main event. This was the most credible, highest level, highest ability fight on the card. Uh, the undisputed super lightweight title was on the line. Katie Taylor got the job done on the scorecard. Unanimous decision. Yet again, an element of controversy in the result. The first fight went to split decision and Katie Taylor got the nod. A lot of people thought that Amanda Serrano had done just enough to nick it first time round. Second fight, Katie Taylor gets a nod again. I think she won by just a couple of rounds on the scorecards. But she was deducted a point for a headbutt. There was a lot of leading with the head in that fight. It does kind of happen when you've got Southpaw versus Orthodox. The heads do kind of dip in and they can they can clash. And we saw quite a bit of that during the fight. It left Amanda Serrano with an absolutely horrible cut above her eye, which we saw a lot of on the broadcast. They were very uh, very good at sort of showing us all the all the gory details of that cut. But Serrano just kept on pushing forward, kept on throwing combinations, big shots. And to be honest, while I haven't scored it round to round, my gut feeling at the end of that fight was that Amanda Serrano had probably done enough to win the majority of the rounds, just to edge it on the scorecards. The judges thought otherwise. And I know there's been some people online screaming robbery. I don't think it was that much of a, of a dodgy decision for it to be considered a robbery. I just think it was a close fight that maybe went opposite to the way that most people thought. So it's 2-0 in the rivalry. Casey Taylor's 2-0 up. But I think we could see a third fight. And I would love to see a third fight between Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano. But let's see it over three-minute rounds. Women's boxing over two-minute rounds is, you know, so, some of the some of the sanctioning bodies are insisting on that. Others are more open to having the three-minute rounds. I'd love to see it over three-minute rounds. Let's get a third fight in over three-minute rounds. If we can do it for an undisputed belt, ideally, I'd like to see it back at lightweight rather than super lightweight. It's quite a big step up for Serrano to be fighting at super lightweight. That's like a three division jump um, from, from where she normally fights, I think. So it's a big jump for her. Let's bring it a little bit closer. Let's let's, let's bring those uh, those poles a little bit closer together and let's fight, as, uh, fight for the undisputed lightweight belt again. Serrano taking on Katie Taylor for the third time over three minute rounds, championship duration, put all the belts up and let's make another great women's boxing match because these two are really carrying the torch for women's boxing. Those two, along with Claressa Shields, who is an absolute superstar and one of one of the best technical boxers on the planet. Those three have really carried the torch for women's boxing and uh, all the while they're healthy, they're fit and they're able to compete. You know, we need to see them as much as possible just to help grow the sport and help generate more stars who can come in and follow them into the sport and really take it to the next level. But at the moment, Serrano and Taylor are the gold standard of women's boxing. And uh, I don't think anyone would complain if they turned around and said they were going to do a third fight. So let's get it. Katie Taylor, Amanda Serrano 3 in 2025. Let's have that in the second half of next year. On Saturday night, all attention went to New York City. Madison Square Garden played host to UFC 309 as John Bones Jones returned to take on Stipe Miocic for the undisputed or partially disputed, John Anik uh, quite correctly uh, stated it as such, partially disputed heavyweight championship of the world. And it was the John Jones show from start to finish. Johnny Bones looking absolutely outstanding. From a technical standpoint, his performance was right up there with some of the best ones we've seen from him back in his light heavyweight prime. This one was superb. And uh, he looked every inch the heavyweight champion of the world at Madison Square Garden on Saturday night. But we do have to say but. Who was he fighting? He was fighting a Stipe Miocic who couldn't retire quickly enough at the end of that fight. This was a Stipe Miocic who was in his early 40s, was a shadow of the man who we've, who we've seen capture the belt, defend the belt multiple times, 
and have some absolute wars in the octagon. This did not look like the same guy. Um, and it looked like a guy who was basically just holding on to take this fight, get this big payday, maybe get the opportunity to walk away with the belt, but then to retire. This was always a retirement fight for Stipe Miocic. And unfortunately, the fight being put back a year, I think did nothing for him at all. It did nothing for him at all. He was just a year older. John Jones was just a year more more prepared. And uh, the gap in class was evident on fight night. John Jones getting the win. Nasty spinning back kick straight to the ribs, finishing the fight in round three. And uh, it begs the question now, will we see John Jones versus Tom Aspinall? This is the fight that the MMA world absolutely is crying out to see. And John Jones in the past has talked about wanting to give the fans what they want. Well, this is what the fans want. But it appears, based on a lot of the comments we've seen, that John Jones does not want this fight. Everything he said has suggested that he does not want this fight. He seems to be making varied excuses as to why he doesn't want the fight. Unless this is just his way of negotiating with the UFC. He, uh, in the post-fight press conference, he said he would want uh, FU money in order to face Tom Aspinall. Um, he wants the UFC to back up the Brinks truck and just pay him an absolutely colossal sum of money, which they should. This is the biggest fight in MMA. Dana White said this would be the biggest fight in MMA. Um, and the biggest fight in MMA deserves the biggest payday in MMA. Will the UFC do it? Can they break out of their structure in order to pay the sort of money that John Jones would want for this fight? Because make no mistake, this is the most dangerous fight that John Jones could take. Tom Aspinall is the real deal at heavyweight. He can strike. He can submit people with his jiu-jitsu. He's outstanding on the mat. He's got good defensive wrestling. His, his boxing is superb. And the thing about him that puts him a cut above everybody else at heavyweight is how fast he is. He moves around like a, like a welterweight. He's so quick. And his ability to match that speed with the power and the technique makes him an incredibly difficult proposition for anybody at heavyweight. As we've seen, he's absolutely torn through the uh, the UFC's heavyweight rankings to become the interim heavyweight champion of the world. And now there is only one thing left, and that is to fight for the undisputed belt. He's not worried whether it's John Jones, but what he has started to do, and this is genius from him, he's now saying that he thinks that John Jones wants to fight. But he's also saying that he's keeping John Jones up at night because there's barely any tape on him. He's got the shortest average fight time in UFC history. There is very little to go on in terms of tape study, which is something that Jones absolutely prides himself on and his team are renowned for. John Jones' fight preparation is up there with the very best. The only one I can think of whose fight prep has been uh, renowned as being that good uh, is George St. Pierre. The ability to game pan and, and come out there completely have all bases covered and then just dismantle an, an apparently dangerous opponent and make them look completely, completely, uh, you know, safe, if you like, is something that very few fighters are able to do. John Jones has done that consistently through his career. He manages to disarm his opponents every time he gets in the cage. How can he disarm Tom Aspinall? Can he disarm Tom Aspinall? This is the puzzle that I think everyone would love to see can John Jones, the GOAT of MMA, defeat the best heavyweight on the planet uh, in the UFC, at least, Tom Aspinall, and uh, really underscore that legacy as a two-division UFC world champion? If that fight doesn't happen, it would be a huge shame and a massive loss to the sport. Um, there are other options for John Jones, but I think all of those other options would probably require him to vacate the heavyweight title, which he's he has said that he's prepared to do that fight would be Alex Pereira which he could do either at heavyweight they could do it at an agreed sort of cruiserweight catch weight if you like 220 pounds maybe 225 just to keep it in the realm of uh, evenness in terms of size or he could look to do something a little bit more outlandish and cut back to 205 and look to win back the belt in a division that he's dominated for so long and really put a cap on his career. For me, that would be the old, you know, if he isn't going to fight Aspinall, drop him back to 205 and challenging for the title against Alex Pereira would be the biggest gangster move that John Jones could do. 
would he want to do it at the age of 37? I think he is looking to lose that that body mass again to get back to 205. That's a big that's a big ask. That is a big ask, and I could completely understand if he didn't want if he didn't want to do that. If he did, if he could cut back to 205, challenge for the light heavyweight belt again and win it back, and then say, "I'm done, peace out, I'm finished." That would just be the ultimate sort of gangster way to finish uh, John Jones's UFC career. But I think the MMA world wants John Jones, Tom Aspinall, and uh, I'm pretty sure the UFC wants that as well. And one more thing, that's a stadium fight. That has to be a stadium fight. I know Dana White says he doesn't like the viewer experience, you know, he doesn't like the fan experience inside a stadium. Uh, the 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 view for the fans is not as good. The staging perhaps isn't quite as as great for TV and all the rest of it. But go back and look at some of those Anthony Joshua uh, fights at Wembley Stadium. Look at the staging that the matchroom team have done in that massive, massive stadium, like 90,000 people. It can be done, and it can be done here in the UK. Could you imagine John Jones versus Tom Aspinall at Wembley Stadium in the summer? That would just be off the charts. That would be off the charts. Alternatively, and this would be a safer option, do it at Allegiant Stadium. Go to that huge stadium in Las Vegas, just down the road from UFC HQ, the Death Star, home of the Las Vegas Raiders. Do it there. Do it there. That would be incredible. And do it during International Fight Week. Have that huge week of build-up. Have that international, all the international media and all the fans flock into Las Vegas for that big week. You know, put a Fight Pass Invitational event on here. You know, do a Power Slap if you want to do one. Do a Power Slap event there. Put all of your products in one town for one week. Let's make it a huge thing. And then the final thing at the end of International Fight Week, 90,000 people inside a huge state-of-the-art sports or sports stadium for the biggest prize in mixed martial arts and the title of the baddest man on the planet, John Jones versus Tom Aspinall. It books itself. All it needs is two signatures on a piece of paper. Let's see if we get it in 2025 fingers crossed all right let's take a look at the results at ufc 309 we'll run through them very quickly we know the main event john jones beating stipe miocic third round tko spinning back kick great performance from john jones he's back to his best will we see him against aspinall fingers crossed co-main event charles Oliveira looks all set to fight for the lightweight belt again he defeats michael chandler in dominant fashion uh, unanimous decision, 49-46 is across the board, completely dominates him. Huge performance. We hope that Chandler would come back and be super competitive. He's always competitive, but he wasn't in Charles Oliveira's class. Charlie Olives gets it done 49-46 twice, 49-45 once, and he will almost certainly face the winner of Islam Makachev versus Armand Sarukian, which we believe will be the headline bout at UFC 311 in Inglewood, California in January. Uh, but Charlie Olives looking to win back the belt that he never lost inside the octagon. Don't forget that. He lost it on the scale ahead of his fight with Justin Gaethje, which he then went on to win. Um, he then got beat by Islam Makachev, who had already won who, who, in order to capture the vacant title. Um, and he's trying to work his way back uh, to the belt. If he gets, he's got that win, he should be back in there for the title next year. Bo Nickel defeats Paul Craig at middleweight, 30 27s across the board. Looks like a dominant performance from Bo Nickel, but you watch the fight, it was not dominant. It was not dominant. He won each of the rounds by a narrow margin, um, by having marginally better striking. That is basically the story of the fight. Uh, that and the fact that the Madison Square Garden crowd were not Bo Nickel fans by the end of that fight. They were chanting, overrated which is harsh because Bo Nickel is still still so young in the game of MMA and he's still working his way up. He's learning on the biggest stage in the sport uh, in the middle of a main card on a huge UFC pay-per-view in what was only his seventh professional fight. People forget this. Yes, he's getting the push. Yes, he's got all the hype. But just look at the facts. He's only seven fights in. You know, there are people who are getting turned away from the contender series because they haven't got enough experience who have that that number of fights. Bo Nickel is in the UFC. He's had a few fights. He's undefeated still. 
And is he pulling up, pulling up trees left, right, and centre? No, he's not. He's winning, and he's looked good against substandard opposition. Now he's coming up against seasoned, respected, ranked opposition. He's going to find it more difficult. It's going to take him time. Cut the guy some slack and let's see how he does. But I think Bo Nickel's going to be a contender within the next couple of years. But it's going to take him time to add those strings to his bow. And uh, all puns intended. And then he's going to move his way up that middleweight division and he'll be challenging within a couple of years of that, I am pretty sure. Um, but yeah, didn't get much love from the New York crowd on Saturday night, Bo Nickel. Uh, big win for Viviani Araujo. Uh, against Karini Silva. Karini Silva coming in on a nine-fight win streak and uh, I think was a big betting favourite for this. Expected to really sort of leapfrog Arujo, work her way up and put herself within shooting distance of a title shot at £125. Did not go her way on fight night. She started well, won the first round. Arujo really sort of bit down on her mouthpiece, rounds two and three. Really gritty, uh, hard-nosed performance by, uh, by Vivi to really turn the fight back in her favour. And uh, sort of the scream that she let out at the uh, at the verdict being announced in her favour really said it all. That was a big win for her, a really big win for her. And hopefully she'll get a fight against someone further up the rankings next time out to give her a chance to potentially position herself for a shot at that flyweight title. And the opening bout of the main card was an absolute banger. Mauricio Hufi defeats James Yontop by unanimous decision, 29-28s across the board. But my goodness me, what a fight this was. Yontop had missed. He turned up for fight week. This was going to be a lightweight fight. And uh, Yontop turned up on fight week. And I think he'd alerted everybody quite early that he wasn't going to make 156, which is the, the, the non-title limit for lightweight. So they arranged a, a catch weight for 165. Then on weighing day, Yontop misses the catch weight by 1.2 pounds. Comes in at 166.2. He's fined a portion of his purse. The fight carries on. Um, and he paid them back. That's all I can say. He paid them back. A huge performance from Yontop. Just came marauding forward, throwing strikes from minute one to the final bell in a losing effort because Mauricio Hufi looks like the real deal and 155 pounds. Um, he's, he's not fully there yet. I think there's definitely some things he needs to add to his game. A jab, a leg kick, a bit more of the fundamentals, the meat and potatoes sort of striking because his nickname is One Shot. And it looked to me like he's the whole fight, he was just looking for a one-shot finish, looking for a highlight reel finish every time he threw a strike. And to me, that kind of detracted from his game a little bit. He's got that in his locker. We know this. He's obviously got the technique and the timing. We saw that. But when you're up against a durable guy who can take a shot like Yontop could, um, it puts you in a, in a position where you could end up getting beaten on the scorecards if your output isn't high enough. Certainly if the guy's throwing back at the sort of rate that Yontop was. So what do you do? We sort of weave in some of the more the more fundamental striking you know striking techniques. Get that jab going, work the low kicks in, and just mix things up a little bit. That'll open more opportunities, I think, for those big highlight reel shots for Mauricio Hufi. But he's in a great team, and they will definitely develop him and help him grow because the Fight Nerds team are a team on the move. They've got to be right up there for like team of the year in twenty twenty four. Bruno Brazil gets a huge win in Manchester against Molly McCann. You've got Carlos Praches, who's surging up the welterweight division. You've got Caio Barallo, uh, who is moving up the uh, the middleweight division. And you've got Hufi at lightweight. There's so much talent in that team. And uh, it's not going to be long before, before those fighters are going to be right up there challenging for championship gold. But Hufi on Saturday night looked very impressive. But the most important thing about that performance, I think, was what he didn't do and just how much more I think we've still got to see from the Brazilian in 2025. He's definitely going to be one to watch next year as he looks to climb that lightweight ladder. That was the main card at UFC 309. It was a huge event. Some great fights on the undercard as well. Jim Miller getting a first round submission. Uh, David Anarman and Roberto Romero in an absolute banger. Uh, Oban Elliott picking up a third round KO victory to earn a post-fight bonus. And Ramiz Brahimai getting a first round KO uh, on home soil. Uh, he comes from the Bronx, just down the road from uh, Madison Square Garden. He earned himself an extra 50 Gs with a first round knockout of Mickey Gall. Great night of fights at Madison Square Garden. And the next big one will be UFC 310, back in Las Vegas in December. 
Alexandra Pantoja welcoming Kai Asakura to the UFC in a flyweight title fight. And the co-main newly, freshly booked Shavkat Rachmanov, who was going to be challenging Bilal Mohamed for the welterweight title in the main event. He now has fresh opposition with uh, Bilal having to pull out injured. He will be facing the un fellow undefeated contender, Ian Machado Gary. Someone's always going to go in the co-main event in Las Vegas at UFC 310. That is going to be an absolute banger. But we will save the talk on that fight for another day because we've come to the end of the podcast this week. Hope you uh, hope you enjoyed the past the past few days and the fallout from the a huge combat sports weekend. The UFC rolls on this weekend. They are in Macau. Uh, we've got a big event in Macau coming up this weekend. We've got Peter Yan versus Davis and Figueredo in the main event. How can that not be an absolute banger of a fight at Bantamweight? That's going to be a lot of fun to watch. So, uh, And if you're over here in the UK, at a decent start time as well, we can actually, actually go to bed at a decent hour after that event has finished. So looking forward to that one. Uh, enjoy the fights this weekend, and I'll speak to you next week.